Welcome, uh, everyone, uh, on behalf of uh, TIPS and uh, Naledi, uh, Groundwork, uh, as well as Peter Wolper. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to, to this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Guillaume masson clair I'm a senior economist uh, at TIPS. I uh, work around just transition and sustainability. And it's really my pleasure uh, to open this, this webinar, um, this, this event, which is the second event, which is part of a series that we are running on uh, the just transition, and particularly to foster a bottom-up, grassroots-led, a citizen-led just transition in South Africa, and more specifically in Steve Twete and Amalashleni uh, in uh, the province of Mpumalanga. Indeed, you know, just transition is very topical at the moment. It is a policy priority. Uh, it has risen to prominence uh, globally and, and domestically, and you know, it has really seized a lot of interest. And I think the, the attendance today proves again uh, that you know, there is really a lot of emphasis being put on fostering, ensuring a just transition going forward, a transition to a low carbon economy, a more sustainable economy. Uh, and that in that process, it is just so that vulnerable stakeholders um, are not negatively impacted or even ideally are actually better off through that process. Yet, the voice of the people who are at the center of the just transition is hardly heard. And that's the case often for you know, citizens, community members, but also workers, small businesses, other businesses in hotspot areas, but also you know, uh, often local government. If we want to ensure an inclusive process, then you know, we need to make sure that we engage and that more than that, we facilitate and support the role of local voices in the transition. And that's critical to achieve any sort of traditional justice and more accurately participatory uh, justice going forward. We're very pleased, very pleased to, to bring uh, a fantastic group of people uh, today to engage with, um, to hear their voices, uh, and, and to, to really debate uh, the challenges and the opportunities associated with the just transition in Mpumalanga. We have community members, we have workers and ex workers and trade unionists, we've got business, and we've got local government. Uh, so really a fantastic, fantastic uh, group of people uh, to hear from the people based in Steve Trade and Malashtani, in Mpumalanga, uh, really um, their views, their perspective, their needs, their requirements. We're also pleased to have a large number in attendance of people from Steve Trete and Menashleni, who we've, we've made sure to support so they could attend. Uh, and uh, I hope we'll hear from them uh, very much so uh, in, in the discussion throughout, throughout this, uh, this event. A little bit of, of protocol, uh, as usual. I'm sure by now you are well versed uh, in, in using uh, Zoom. Um, but uh, if not, I note that you can use the chat function. Um, make sure that uh, you select uh, uh, everyone. You have to send a message to everyone before uh, you type your message. Otherwise, it will only go to uh, the hosts. Uh, so make sure that you uh, you select everyone. And then we encourage you to really introduce yourself as well in the chat. You also can use the Q&A function to uh, raise any, any concerns or, or comments or questions to, to our panelists. Um, and uh, when we get to the discussion, you can also raise your hand and then we'll invite you to speak uh, and to the floor as well. 
So without further ado, um, let's get on. Let's get on with it. Uh, it's my my pleasure to uh, hand over to uh, colleague uh, Amida Didat, who is the executive director of Naledi, um, who is going to give a bit of a, a background and, and context to our discussion before we get to uh, the meat of it. Uh, so Amida, uh, the floor is yours. Over to you. Thanks, Tommy Gelo, and maybe just um, put on my video just to say hello to everybody and good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone uh, to our second public event. I have the privilege um, on behalf of the TIPS Naledi and Groundwork with Peter Walpi Consortium Partners, uh, funded by the UK PAC, to, to basically take you through uh, some of the history of our project, where we're going, and give you some background. So just in terms of the project summary and, and, and the name, so we know that the, the main aim and objective of the project is distilling the just energy transition in South Africa, um, wanting to harmonize conflict and seek opportunities. So we know obviously with coal being quite a central resource in the Mpumalanga area, um, there's quite a substantive coal value chain. Um, but at the same time, there's also the, the, you know, the challenges of climate change and the issues of the just transition. Um, but when we talk about the just transition and perhaps specifically for, for the, the project team and the orientation that we're coming from, it's really wanting to practically interrogate and tease out what these, um, what these challenges are and also ensure that from, from our perspective that the, the, you know, the practical benefits actually speak to the concerns of workers, the community and the environment. So again, who we are, it's a consortium led by TIPS and the other consortium partners is Naledi, uh, Peter Walpi, and then from a civil society perspective, while not necessarily part of the formal consortium, but definitely an integral partner, um, we, we work quite substantively with groundwork. Um, in terms of who we envisage the beneficiaries to be for the project, um, the work will concentrate on, on the Mpumalanga province, um, with the main beneficiaries coming from the Imalahleni, and Steve Twitty local municipalities. So having said this for the comrades who come from the um, Secunda area who are working in Cecil, obviously Cecil being quite a, a key emitter when we look at the broader context of uh, coal emissions and the whole need for a transition. So despite the fact that Secunda doesn't necessarily fall within the Malachlani or Steve Twitty uh, municipalities, we're quite um, sensitive to the role uh, that Cecil is playing, but also more importantly, the, in, to the fact that we need to include uh, the petrochemical and the and the coal value chain um, industries along um, sorry and the value chain industries along that particular sector into this particular research process. We also, in instances where communities are quite extensively involved in the life after coal campaign, as well as the the just transition and participating in key issues to inform what they believe a just transition should be and should look like. Um, we do also facilitate processes through other projects um, to get a stronger voice inserted into the um, into the project, while not specifically part of the UK pack, but we definitely try and find synergies. We've also identified key state, uh, the, the following key stakeholders as being central to our work, um, and these include national government departments, of course, they're the ones who make the key decisions. Um, so it's important to be, to, to, to be advocating and um, planning and engaging quite extensively with our national departments. Um, we have the Mpumalanga province, um, so looking at local government, looking at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we do civil society organizations, so apart from groundwork, there are a range of civil society organizations that work and do extensive and really important work um, in the province, and we try to engage either through groundwork or through other connect, uh, connections um, with communities and community organizations. Communities um, are also important, so you don't necessarily have to be formally part of a civil society organization to be able to participate or for us to be concerned about the key challenges and the impacts of that coal is having on your life. Um, we definitely, as a, as a consortium also, and particularly as Naledi, um, it has to be labor and we work across the federations, um, ensuring that there's broad participation and input from all workers involved, regardless of the affiliation that you hold. Um, and then of course, we also deal with the issue, the, we also work with um, retrenched workers because if we're looking at the Mpumalanga region, the issues around the coal-fired power stations that are closing, retrenched workers are, are definitely suffering the collateral damage. Um, when one puts in a transition 
um, towards a so-called green economy without put, without implementing a substantive, a, a green uh, sorry just transition. Um, we also engage with it with the ILO, and they're quite committed to both the green green economy, um, the just transition, as well as a decent work country program, and as a uh, alliance partner or as a, a tripartite uh, alliance partner, it's important to have um, them on board. Um, we recognize um, the issue of small business as well as the NBI and ESCOM. So NBI and small business, of course, integral to uh, the economy of, um, of the province and therefore working quite closely with workers as well as with the, with the Mpumalanga uh, province. And then most in the NBI, because a lot of the companies that are currently within the Mpumalanga province happen to work with the NBI or are members of the NBI, and the NBI, in terms of the presidential commission, is quite central to engaging and providing um, perspective uh, and conceptual framing to the whole um, issue, notion of the just transition. ESCOM, of course, key important player. We all know who ESCOM is. And you cannot be discussing coal uh, fired power stations or even uh, the notion of energy or different kind of energy system without having one of the central players in the world. So definitely ESCOM. I think the key objectives of the project take, uh, which we're taking from the proposal, which are directly taken from our proposal. So the project aims to facilitate the co-development of a coherent just transition plan for affected communities and workers in the Imalahani and Steve Twetty municipalities. It's structured to build on previous work and paves the work for implementation and action towards a new and transformed Impumalanga that is inclusive of all the vulnerable stakeholders. It has the potential to be replicated throughout the country in line with, with uh, sustainable climate change, socioeconomic and COVID-19 economic recovery development priorities and actions. So I think one of the key things that we've been finding as we've been engaging is that because of the importance and the strategic importance that Mpumalanga is playing in the context of coal, but also what the implications would be when one moves um, away from a coal dominant, when you start contemplating what a what an economy would look like um, without coal as a central um, resource um, that, that drives our economy. Um, there's many people that are coming to Mpumalanga and many of the comrades that we work with, both from communities as well as from labor, have been talking about being workshop, you know, having suffering from workshop fatigue. Um, we're hoping in this particular process not to just workshop and take, which is what many people do when they come into an area is to take from the communities and take from workers, but in many instances, uh, sometimes create hope, but leave nothing behind. I think what we're really trying to hope in this process is to come out with something really substantive, something concrete, but driven directly by the communities and the workers themselves uh, and to give them the language or to, to at least facilitate a process where they may have the language to articulate their own stories and give voice to, um, to the, to the just transition that belongs to them. I think this project takes a common approach uh, where we put in workers, community and citizens at the forefront. I think this is absolutely critical that we, that we make this point because there's quite a few organizations working on the just transition. Um, the notion of a just transition uh, for many, or the concept of it um, has been changed as you move into the landscape. Um, however, from a worker perspective and a labor perspective, the issue of a just transition is worker centric and it puts it's a principle more than a concept and it definitely puts workers community um, citizens as well as the environment as the key central points at which we um, we wanting to engage and wanting to see uh, an impact i think one of the other key issues in terms of our orientation is we really want to through this process um, address or start to unpack um, and look at how the just transition could start to contribute or act as a catalyst towards it, issues of poverty and inequality. Um, there's an emphasis, of course, as I indicated, on labor, community, and the local level at the local level. And we'd want to advocate for the full and active participation in from these from these actors um, in defining and determining what a just transition policy is, as well as its implementation. Um, we also want to ensure that uh, to ensure the success of the project, it would require us all to work actively together. Um, both at the national, provincial and local government level, but also um, we have to acknowledge that there needs to be work with the private sector. Um, and the project focuses on the implementation by bridging and coordinating the work from both a top-down and bottom-up approach, and by working through the blockages and areas of convergence to facilitate change through a solution formulation in the areas of Imalakleni and Sif Um 
in terms of the chronological order, in terms of how the project has, has unfolded, we have we, we started with an inception phase and we've engaged with, um, with, with various stakeholders where we had particular workshops and we had our first um, process and dialogue. Um, we're now moving into a second phase, which is uh, more, more focused on the social dialogue process. Um, thereafter, we'll have a research component and some of these activities run um, concurrently. And I think the social dialogue process, both in terms of stakeholder interviews um, and, and uh, engagements, but also when we're talking about the public, um, the public event, um, this would also part, form part of that particular process. We then also have a, um, a research component. And as I indicated, this runs concurrently. So as much as we're doing the engagements, we've also got a research team that's, that's doing the background research, writing up policy briefs, um, engaging with the with the policy documents, engaging with the various government departments, and keeping abreast with the with the various changes uh, and policy recommendations that are happening in order to ensure that the research is congruent with the the social policy uh, engagements that we're having. I think the third component is then a capacity building program. So we we currently um, engaging with our, our stakeholders through the social dialogue process, and we hope through that in the, the enhanced engagements. Um, we'd get a um, we'd have, we'd be able to develop a really comprehensive and fulfilling capacity building program. I think in many instances when people make reference to capacity building, it's it's usually from a power relation, where there's an assumption that you know we are the ones that have the knowledge and we come in to capacitate uh, comrades um, with uh, or empower them with uh, with with um, information. I think it's important to say that from from the perspective that we approaching uh, the capacity building program is that we recognize that the communities, the workers, um, the various vulnerable, vulnerable stakeholders, as well as uh, business, local government, um, and the the, um, the the communities in the area are the ones who actually know the area very well and more than you know bringing what we know around the just transition is really about learning and engaging constructively in order to be able to um, define and, and come up with a really strong uh, just transition uh, program that is really driven by the communities. And I think the capacity building um, approach is also one way we can also, as the, as the people and the, 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 the expert, so-called experts coming in, um, we'll, we'll find that the experts that we're engaging are also going to be capacitating us quite, quite substantively in and around the key challenges that they're facing. Um, I think the last area would be we have um, we have a process for recommendations for action, um, and the recommendations will cover the just transition process, policy interventions, and implementation projects of any other issues arising from the project, as well as, as particularly uh, in order to ensure the sustainability of the just transition process. Um, we also have a pro in, in terms of a key evaluation mechanism the project is located within a meals process which is the monitoring evaluation accountability and learning so we're constantly reflecting engaging and from a from an open ended perspective wanting to or we do give recognition to the fact that it's not just about us bringing information but also a learning process that's two way and there's a constant reflection and, and, and introspection perspective um, that's that runs throughout the project uh, in terms of the, its aims and objectives, um, in terms of our outputs, we want to generate co-ownership of the project. So that's one of our key orientations, and I think it leads to the meal uh, process as well. Um, we want to ensure the facilitation of stakeholder engagement. Um, so we're creating the ne necessary platforms for stakeholder engagement, and again, um, quite um, interactive and collaborative, and, and, we, and, and therefore we're working with the key stakeholders as identified. Um, we also think it's important to develop knowledge products. So um, in many instances, when you come into an organization or into a, into a particular process, um, we don't want to leave and then there the not be any momentum. So some of the key policy briefs, the, um, uh, I think we're even doing a documentary, the, the, the research outputs, the dialogues, all of these processes are, are supposed to en enhance the, the, the dialogues and the engagements that comrades are already having um, in their provinces, and we want we want to bring a value add as opposed to making comrades dependent on on us as the UK Pact uh, consortium or, or the, the the people running the project. In terms of an enhancement of skills, we hope through this process to that comrades would would um, be able to reflect and and indicate to us that there's been an enhancement of the skills and that they acquired through 
uh, our capacity building programs um, and that the information and material that we've um, that we've used throughout the process has been one that is facilitated to empowerment for our stakeholders both in terms of the information but also in, in, in terms of the engagement and the research that we're able to share um, we believe that this is essential as with knowledge stakeholders can contribute to their own solutions and can ensure that the implementation of these solutions are for the empowerment and betterment of themselves rather than us um, having to influence it. I think the last few points in terms of form, we'd like to formulate the recommendation for action, and I think it's particularly for the implementation implementable projects to be taken forward. So we're hoping, unlike many projects where people come do the research and the actual output is the, is, is the research report, we're hoping that the recommendations that we put forward, particularly for action, will, will actually see traction both from national government, from the Chamber of Commerce, ESCOM, um, local government, as well as our key stakeholders, which is labor um, and the communities and civil society organizations that we work with. Um, and just to go on to the final point, which is the aims and objectives that we hope to contribute to. Um, we'd like to ensure that they're informed and empowered vulnerable stakeholders, as well as other beneficiaries. Um, we believe that there should be an emergence of co-developed recommendations and a solutions-oriented project, and that, that this project is solution-oriented. Um, we need to reduce opposition to the coal phase, uh, to coal being phased out. And I think this um, one has to, we have to see this within the broader context of climate change. And more than just uh, the reduction in terms of the opposition has to be from a, a critical understanding of not just coal as a resource and in, in the context of energy, but coal in its entire value chain. Um, but with that, with, with that having been said, it has to also be taken uh, within the context of job creation, uh, a just transition and not mere collateral damage for communities and um, workers. I think and the last one is a greater cap capability and capacity by local stakeholders, such as the municipalities to implement and raise resources for a just, trans just transition and its relevant interventions. And I think as much as we talk about local stakeholders and make reference to local municipalities. We're hoping that through that same process, our workers, uh, um, the unions, as well as our communities and civil society organizations um, will benefit in the same way. I think the, 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 other slide, the other document that I wanted to share, and I just wanted to get a sense from the chair in terms of time, am I still fine? I'll leave it at that, but I think what we could do is we'll, um, in terms of the, the um, I think in terms of the key, the key outputs for the project i've actually uh, presented it in the in the overview so i don't think it, this one would be necessary thank you very much and sorry for taking so much of time thanks i think the next do i go through you or do i hand over now to comrade thomas i think we've got two facilitators for the session today the one is comrade thomas from groundwork and comrades um, and he sees we're from naledi so i'll hand over to comrade thomas who i believe is going to be taking us through the first session over to you, Comrade Thomas. Uh, thanks, Comrade uh, Amida, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so I think um, uh, Comrade Amida and uh, Gelo have already introduced um, the project itself. And um, I think what will be uh, important is uh, for us to understand how we want to approach this. So in the first session, I think I will have four panelists and um, they come from diverse backgrounds. And I think um, what I would want to request is for all panelists, uh, not, not only to try and unpack the just transition, but I want them to, to be very direct, uh, to begin to give us an understanding of um, what does a mine closure or a closure of, of an industrial coal-fired power plant mean to them? What does it mean to their jobs? What does it mean to, the, to their livelihoods? And also maybe to explore a bit, uh, what are the opportunities in other sectors or what are the opportunities if we find ourselves in a situation where in we have to close a mine and we have to close a power station, um, for different reasons. Um, I think currently we, we know that we've seen mines and industries closing for economic reasons. But what kind of impact did that have on society and on people's livelihood? So to kick off our session, I would like to introduce our four panelists. Uh, the first one will be uh, Comrade Sipo Lamini, 
who is currently an official of CEPAU. And uh, CEPAU is also the acting provincial of Bumalang Regional Secretary. And he started being a member of CEPAU whilst he was working at East Trans Plastics in 1992. And in 1994, became a shop steward, but also uh, the chairperson at plant level. And CEPAU has also served within uh, as a branch chairperson uh, of the ANC in Sakane, but also CEPAU has been very involved in politics since he was a member of the South African Communist Party. And he has worked very closely with the current General Secretary of COSATO, uh, Comrade Piggy Chalinchali. And um, when I last spoke to Sipo, Sipo was saying I was groomed by Comrade Piggy Chalinchali. So we might as well uh, accredit um, Comrade uh, Piggy Chalinchali uh, for Sipo's um, politics and understanding of politics. And then um, we also have a uh, Mr. Jabu Kambule. Jabu Kambule is the current regional educator in the high field of NUM, but he has also served in different capacities. capacities. He was um, schooled around Sidibing, but also uh, became a shop steward with, with NUMSA. Later, he resigned from NUMSA and um, became a member of um, NUM. And most of his work focus was around dealing with wage negotiations, recruitment, retrenchments, campaigns, representing workers um, at the CCMA. So Jawa had um, a very extensive uh, knowledge of that. But also notable, Jawa is also a member of um, the Communist Party. And he also served in his executive structures. And he was also the convener uh, of the Trade Union Commission. And he also served as the Secretary General of the National Association of the Royal Society of South Africa uh, since 2006 to 2009, and was mainly responsible for organizing. So comrades, I'm mentioning this so that we could tap into the capacities of people into, in terms of mobilization and public speaking. And um, I think further to show Jawu's capacity in terms of that, he went on Operation Kanyisa, which was mainly focused on how we could reduce um, or be energy efficient. And then uh, also from um, our community partners, we have uh, Chambisile Mbete, who is a member of one environmental movement. Chambisile is based in Emalasheni, and he has been an activist over the past four or five years, if I recall. And lastly, we have um, Stella Masina, who lives in Bulen Swap. Um, Stella is one of the Ex mine workers who used to work for Optimum and currently unemployed. And um, I think um, they organized themselves as the former mine workers of, of Optimum so that uh, they could try and find a solution into their current problems or current challenges. So, without a further ado, I would uh, directly ask Chensil uh, uh, Mbete to introduce herself, but also briefly tell us about Fugani and then ask, uh, answer probably the questions about what, what does he, she think about the closure of mines and power stations in terms of jobs and livelihoods. And if um, there are any opportunities uh, that she thinks might be available with, with, with the closure of, of some of these industries and mines. Over to you, Temsile. Okay, it seems Tempisile has disappeared and maybe without um, a waste of time, I will ask Stella Massina uh, to share and answer uh, some of the questions um, I have raised. Good day, everyone. I am Stella Massina. I'm from Polensop, 
I'm an ex-employee of Optimum. As much as we're on this topic, I sh I'm starting to, uh, I feel like crying or do whatsoever. But when it comes to Optimum, I feel like uh, there's a lot uh, which we don't know, which we know, but currently at Optimum, we've got one problem. Uh, we're working at Optimum, we're having a good life, mining the coal, as we're busy with the coal, but we're mining the coal and we're living a good life. We're aging ourselves and our family, we're happy. But currently, the closure of Optimum, guys, uh, affects a lot of people. Uh, when I'm talking about a lot of people, there are people who, were, who used to stay at Aeroland and you used to have uh, house helpers and all, all those things. Currently, they have to change as well as the mine closed. Uh, Tom, uh, when I'm talking about Optimum, you know very well I was looking there. Uh, after the mine closed and when it's come to pulling soap, in fact, when it's come to pulling soap, as much as uh, ESCOM is on, his, on a line as well, which means ESCOM and Pulling Soap and, um, and Optimum will make Pulling Soap the ghost town. When I'm saying that, my heart, uh, when it's come, and I'm sorry when there's a, a guy from NUM, maybe, eh? yeah, when there's a guy from NUM, uh, I believe maybe, I don't know whether he, he or she's aware. He's, 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 ne? he's a man. Okay. I believe maybe he, he can be aware of, of that and he can assist me on that. But optimum, guys, and the main closure, it's a problem. Really. Not from putting soap or whatever. Putting soap, maybe back can drain the hole because we're having people from KZN, from Eastern Cape there. But currently now, we don't have anyone. Pulling soap is starting to be a ghost town even now. Because if you, if, if you could go now, they're pissed, they're, they're standing there at the shops, they, they, they've got nothing to do, they're just standing there. You understand? Then the thing is, I don't know what's going to happen with Optimum, with Pulling Soap, in fact. Because Pulling Soap, we've got uh, minerals, which is cold. Uh, on that, I don't know, please, guys. Can you please assist? I don't know where, where can you assist? Because now, the, uh, when we've got uh, a child that had a uh, layer school, immediately when they close, uh, when they close Optimum, you must remove the child to public school. I don't say maybe public school is useless or something, but you wanted the, your child to get that education from uh, work school or uh, or whatsoever. But at the end, you must remove your child there. Why? Because we don't, we won't afford to pay the school fees there. You won't afford to pay transport. You won't afford to pay anything there. Even your diet at the on your house, you must change. Why you must change? You can't afford it. You must go back. I don't know where, but you must go back there. Everything, guys. Uh, Optimum and Escom is busy. Even Escom, even now Escom, we used we used to work there. Shut down. We work two weeks. Next week, you, they will say, you know, that's chief. You must go back and stay at home. Nothing to do. You must wait for another shutdown. Maybe after six months. What about the six months that you, you, you will be staying at home? You understand? Then now, I don't know what to do, guys. And uh, that's why I, I end up joining Thomas with the groundwork. Maybe they can open my mind, explore my mind. I don't know how, but I believe Thomas can do that with Tom Crown, Bobby, and everyone, Victor, they can do that. That's why I end up joining Groundwork and try to work with them and tell them what's going on and put them to do my own research. Please, I don't know, but I think it's that. Optimum, it's a, it's a heart of putting soap and Rena, even Metalbeck. I don't, I know Metalbeck, there are many companies here, but when it comes to Optimum, I know very well. Yeah. Maybe I will come back, guys. Let me just put down myself. I will come back. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thanks, Kelo. Um, I think, guys, for, for the sake of time, I will try and limit every speaker to five minutes because um, 
Um, I want all of us to be involved in the discussion. I want not only the panelists to speak, but I want also everyone to get an opportunity to ask questions and get a response. So um, I think Temsile is back on. Temsile, okay, we'll come back to Temsile later. Uh, Sipo, can we take this opportunity <clears throat> and ask you maybe to focus on the questions, who you are very quickly, and we have uh, five minutes for that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, comrades, uh, the topic is very painful, first of all, and uh, we are experiencing a lot of unemployment currently. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, yesterday the unemployment rate was 34.4%. And uh, for me, I don't think that the idea of closing coal mine should have started before they can make a research that how is the economy is going to be affected? How is the um, an unemployment is going to be affected? How are the every people who are around those coal miners are going to be affected? Even as well as the unionists, how are we going to be affected? But under the, under the mass circumstances, it has happened. We have comrades, families who have lost their job, currently so. And the, the unemployment is very high. Uh, for me, from us as Sepau, we don't need to be very shy to say that we don't, we don't agree about the closing of mines in terms of codes because there is these things that they are saying with air pollution. Let them upgrade. They are engineers and chemicals that can try to minimize that situation. So the, the closing of coal mining industry is going to change a lot of things in our country. And um, there is a, a lot of questions that we're asking ourselves that we as South African, they are saying we must, there is air pollution, whereas as I'm talking to you, there is tons and tons of calls who are going overseas, uh, especially China, but we are being told that the coal is having a lot of damage. Why are we not improving the system of having law uh, to minimize that air pollution? So I think, comrade, without saying much, this is painful. This is what we as union, we as unionists, especially my my colleague and friends, my sister union, NUM, and those unions who are affected, we needed to engage in this issue thoroughly and, and raise our voice that this thing is going to affect a lot of things in the mining industry, in the, in the area around those mining. So without waste any time, I think, I think we have been debating this issue. We have raised our concerns um, I think our concern will be taken into consideration. So uh, with those weights, I think I have set them out full, hoping that uh, my colleagues and my comrades from NUM will say more. Thank you, comrades. Uh, thanks, thanks um, comrade Tipo. I think um, what you're raising is important that um, there is a big challenge. Uh, especially when it comes to unemployment, and everyone is concerned about that. But um, let me give over to Comrade Jabu and um, hear what he has to say in terms of these questions without any waste of time. Comrade Jabu, over to you. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists and also to the panelists. Uh, I think in, in trying to be short as much as I can, 
Uh, but let me remind, as, as my as a comrade Sipe and the others have indicated that yesterday, uh, the result of the first quarter have been released of 34.4% of an unemployment rate. And also the 50% the of the working age group are unemployed, including the 73% of the youth are not having a metric certificate, in particular mathematics, uh, 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 to be specific. Now, after painting the very same picture, let me tell you now, I, I won't deal with the optimum because optimum you have heard yourself. But currently, as we are speaking, there are two mines that uh, are, are being closed because they've lost a contract from ESCOM. Uh, it is in Yanga uh, Trefonte and also Velche, Velchele. Those are two mines, and each mine has a has employed an approximately 500 employees. And 95% of those employees are blacks, uh, unfortunately, to, to bring this, this uh, 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 dynamic. Now, uh, uh, they are struggling as we speak, and the mine is between Delmas and, and between Delmas and Whitbank. So taxi industries is being affected by that. The transportation of coal is being affected because people have to be stopped uh, because of this contract that they have, that was lost by these two months in ESCO. So that has, 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 has a very bad uh, impact uh, 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 on the livelihood of those individual employees. Uh, there is a mining community that was produced particularly by this mining. Uh, it is Victor Kanye municipality. Uh, formerly known as Delmas. Uh, I can mention only one word, uh, uh, Thomas, so that you understand. It's what seven. What seven has uh, 22 mines within the very same word, 22 mines. Then just imagine that if, if, if 22 mines, one mine has employed approximately 600 employees, then you multiply that 600 by 22, then it will give you 132, or in fact, it will give you 13,200. These are a number of people that are employed in that, uh, in those mines, in one word. And that, that Delmas on its own is dependent on two sectors, is the farming and the coal sector. So immediately, and, 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 and the coal, Coal sector, the mining has employed approximately the 90% of the company in one ward. Then just imagine that if that ward uh, that has employed 13,200, then you multiply that by 10 because one, one man has to feed uh, 10 family members. So it takes you to 132,000. So that is a problematic. Now, we are not saying we must not invest in 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 in, in uh, clean clean uh, in the clean economy, or we must not have an alternative to that. But currently, as I've put the scenario, that seventy three percent of the young people they don't have metric, and we are not saying let let it be a total phase out uh, from the coal mining to the low carbon economy, but let's address the current situation that we are facing now, maybe if we have, if we, we can manage because there are systems in place, good uh, uh, negotiations that before you start a, a mine, there will be a closure, there will be a transition rehabilitation and so on. But those are just agreements that are not being fulfilled because employers, I can make an example, many companies when they retrench now, they don't agree to, to go to a reskilling of workers because the act is saying that process is voluntarily, doesn't force anyone to enter into that agreement. So I'm saying we are having agreements in place with the Department of, uh, of Minerals, with whoever in the act and law, but they are not followed. So I'm saying before that, it must take us some years before we address the issue of skills uh, 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 yes, the issue of skills, education, and so on. So not having, well, only one man that is not having a contract in ESCOM is affecting the entire economy. It be your transport, it, it will be your, your the, 
uh, the people that are selling food, the businesses, accommodation industry, everybody uh, is going to be affected. Let, let me pause there because I've just painted the, the scenario and what is currently happening around the Takanya, Delmas, and other areas that are, are dependent on the mining. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, thanks, thanks to all our panelists. And um, we start waste of time. I'm, I'm not going to take or respond to questions and comments in, in, in the chat. I've seen the, a couple of them. But um, what I would want, I would want to hand over to my co-facilitator so that we can immediately try and elicit some response from the municipalities, from business, so that by the time we move to some of the key challenges, I mean, um, Comrade Jawe has just pointed out that even workers are struggling in, in, in mines. So, you know, they get a trench, they don't get enough out of it. Um, I think, no, before I move on, I think Temsile is back on. Temsile, Please, can you share your quick experiences in about two, three minutes? Hello, everyone. Can I, uh, Thomas, can I speak in Sizulu? Because I want to hear myself and I want to cough everything out. Okay, that's On fine. But the, um, just stick to the time, it's fine. Okay. Um, my name is Tembisile. I'm from Emalasheni, from the community organization from, uh, it's called VEM. Bugani environmental movement. So, ti na singa basali, basi malasheni, abasi benza ngaba ngamumparat ku organizationi yetu mailani environment. Si fila uguti, gugu gune ke puparat wabasali na basi benz yenda ba yechas transition. Because ti na imparat ni maskulu mangechas transition because we normally raise ama awenesisi. As fund is a band to nature's transition. The band to back about special about seven, about seven, a mama in about seven, and a lash, guma, guma mine in a la guma coal fired power stations. But fill out with it, Tina, Sba Moshela, Amatuba, um seven. So in a little less bona, Nayotina, and Paratin. So Abbasis, we see some more, but Bacabango good it in a masculine transition, Sibula, Amatuba, um seven, Wabo, our seven, the corner, Moba Bonabanga, Zuguti. Banga understand Uguti in each as transition because a good cogwenzi wire, nature's transition, fundisa, a bantaba sevenza and a lash in a bantaba pillar, the economy a lash. Perhaps comment us, comment, um, Thomas can translate and then you know you can continue and then give him the opportunity to translate because we've got some comrades who have joined who would love to hear the key issues that you're raising, but it would be unfair to, to ask Comrade Thomas to respond at the end, but also not be fair to your presentation. Sorry, Comrade, to interrupt. I was trying to take notes so that um, I could do a quick summary once she has done so that we could save okay, time. Okay, so if, that, if you're comfortable with that, then sure. Okay. So you can continue, Tim Sile. All right, guys. So Tina Singum Parat was a Malachin, say I feel a hit, say I go to Luxisa. Ogu let her eleke as a and zwang elash because he has to rail as he as he afford and is no seller a man's a man's wet and no lily. I ask Lisa put our tolagal galula work or sometimes the guna man's and sometimes the as now. So see a boot or ukshung obuletra ele production elash la emalashen. No kula ogu ogu as ogu's pet it's in a cool community as emalashen school of a cool. Easy for the 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 iris babies or whatever respiratory illnesses. So I'm gonna say a puma easy pejela. Where lana singa where by singa I told you from Ama clinics where to awana i medication. If I need it, I know who can go to. As soon as I'm kiskati, I refer, I refer, and I seek to all the sick funai. If I need sick to all. Now, but I'm busy busy. I'm busy busy. I'm not. Logo kula eskulumanga esku eskalanga go singum parat. Bana gunabo. Bayak to all. It's just to guti, abantu ba fila uguti, abanam pilong a panje we lash. Aba understand uguti, it's just transition in a go gonke, in a matubum se benzi, in a pilo any. If the sibona uti nangama tubum se benzi, wamanyama sect, nyinga mentiona i agriculture. Ever banga rehabilitator, 
We can do something because we So we send something greener, space. So Thank you. Thanks, Comrade Timsile. So in 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 short, uh, what Timsile was saying is that um she lives in Emalasheni and she is a member of one environmental movement. Now, uh, as the residents, not only as activists, but as the residents, um, they feel a, a lot of brand, they feel a lot of pain. And what concerns them most is that there seems to be a huge gap between community people and workers when it comes to the discussion around a just transition. Uh, the, common narrative that comes from the coal workers is that they feel the discussion around the just transition is more about stopping their jobs and ending their livelihood. And on the other hand, residents who live in El Malasheni feel um, overburdened by the mines and the electricity sector. And there are a couple of things that she mentioned that are of concern to them. One is that uh, we've got the coal, we've got the coal power plants, but electricity is expensive in the area. So people in Emalasheni cannot afford electricity, but also it is not reliable. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. She also mentioned that there was a whole problem around how water is being continuously contaminated, but except for contamination also, the supply of water is also not consistent. One minute you have water through your tap and then the next day or the next minute you don't. And um, there's also a huge concern around um, the impacts of coal in, in terms of their health. And it has now become a, a common thing that people will have uh, respiratory diseases and without getting any adequate help from the clinics. Normally what the clinics and the hospital around with bank will do they will keep referring them from one institution to another without getting any proper health care. And um, what is of concern is that not only does this affect the residents, but it also affects the same coal workers who live in, in the community and have little or no resource at all to deal with it. And lastly, he spoke um, passionately about the issue of rehabilitation because they, she says they are exposed to a lot of unrehabilitated mines and to them that is a cause for concern. And uh, the, the, the mere fact that this land needs to be rehabilitated can create jobs rather than end the jobs of coal workers. So this is one option we need to think about when it comes to how do we transition away <laughs> such that we don't see the transition uh, as a threat. So I think that's in summary what um, Tim Sile was speaking about. So yeah, uh, thanks to Mr. for that. Now I would um, briefly, quickly try and introduce my um, colleague, uh, Cesar Chiso, who works for Naledi, and Cesar will lead us um, in terms of getting a quick response uh, from the local government and, and business, and then after we can take questions and answers. Over to you, Cesar. Thank you very much, Comrade Thomas, and um, good afternoon to everybody on the, um, who has joined us here today. Um, I just also want to thank you, thank the, the panelists for those inputs. Um, so we have respondents from um, the Middleburg Chamber of Commerce, um, Ms. Anna Marth. Um, I wanted to read her, uh, her, 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 her profile. Uh, it is quite a long profile, but she is the CEO of the Middleburg Chamber of Commerce, um, and um, in, is, 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 is also a managing director of Busmid, uh, which is a property management company owned by the Middleburg Chamber of Commerce. Um, and she will uh, be speaking on, in, just responding to some of the issues that were raised from the, the perspective of 
um, of businesses um, because the middle middleberg chamber of commerce represents a, um, a number of businesses in the uh, middleberg or steve trete municipality we um, also have um, excuse me <laughs> we also have mr michael gossi um, who, who is a assistant director um, for LED um, with 29 years of experience in the private and public sector and is from the Steve Twitter municipality. Um, so without wasting any further time, I just want to then invite comrade, um, we'll start with, with business. Um, we'll start with uh, Ms. Alamath Ott, um, who is, as I, as I mentioned, the CEO of the Middleburg Chamber of purpose and is someone that is very, very passionate about uh, the development of Bumalanga um, or Middleburg and um, the Steve Trader municipality and its people. So without taking up any further time, uh, I will uh, bring on Ms. Anamar just to give responses to some of the issues that have been raised by the panelists um, uh, that, we, that we heard from. Um, so with that, I hand over to Ms. Anamath just to give us um, some responses and some perspectives from her side around um, some of the issues that have been raised. Um, just go ahead, Ms. Anamath. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I don't think I need to go into all the crises and situation business and everybody is because of the COVID lockdown, um, the closure of some of the mines last week, 800 jobs lost uh, at the uh, Sereki mine, um, the crisis at um, Optimum, um, some of the businesses that did business with Eskom and things didn't go as well as uh, planned and all the horrible things that uh, has happened this last couple of years. Um, what happened uh, with uh, some of the visits that I've done overseas, we went to um, on a local economic development um, tour in Germany and I saw some of the coal fire power stations uh, closed down. Uh, that was uh, in Cottbus and we went to Dortmund and we saw some of the steel manufacturing plants that, went down, uh, that closed down and how they created tourism attractions and I was just surprised, you know, that so many jobs were lost um, and now they're trying. And then recently, if you look at what happened with Highfield Steel, how many people lost their jobs uh, because Highfield Steel closed down, um, you know, that's still a sore wound within the um, Emma Lashleni, Steve Twitty municipal business community as well as the uh, local community. And now we've got a crisis and a shortage of steel. So if Highfield Steel was still operational, we could have had um, a good uh, uh, boost in our economy. So blindly closing everything down um, has no, not been one of my um, proposals. And, and I've been uh, lobbying since 2017 that we need to find a way to repurpose Komati and Hindina power stations. Um, there must be a way we can tra train people on green energy, we can train people on all the different areas that is linked to energy, uh, uh, pr pr to produce energy, as well as uh, manufacturing. We need to bring in more manufacturing because we lost a lot of businesses in our area because of the price of electricity. So. Um, for the chamber, I hear what everybody says. Um, one of, many of my members are suffering in the same way, you know, that where they have to lay off staff. It's the, you know, um, it is such an emotional thing uh, on the management side as well, just to lay off people. It's just it's nice, much nicer to give people production bonuses. So yes, we believe that there's a future in our area and we need to be innovative and think of what we can do to make sure that um, as a community and as a region, we actually prosper. That is a business point of view of the just transition. Thank you very, very much. Um, um, I think, you know, the issues that you are raising um, sound quite familiar. So there's definitely uh, links or linkages between some of the issues that 
uh, communities, workers, and workers are facing in relation to uh, the shutting down of fire power stations, as well as the uh, some of the some of the mines. And I think you know, um, with the current crisis of unemployment um, that we are experiencing. This is quite a thing. This this is um, exactly why we see resistance of a just transition to a lower carbon economy because there needs to definitely be a plan as to what happens to these um, workers, communities, businesses, um, and these and and the towns uh, that are affected by these. Um, I will then hand over to Mr. Michael Gorsi from the Steve Twitty municipality. Um, I'm sure, Mr. Gorsi, you've um, heard some of the issues that have been raised by members of communities, um, unemployed or former um, um, workers um, who were employed at, at in one of the mines uh, being optimum. You've heard from the trade unions. Uh, we've also heard um, from, from business. And um, it would be interesting just to hear also from the perspective of the, of the municipality as to how the municipality, um, and what, what, what is the thinking of the municipality and how does the municipality uh, plan on responding to the current crisis that are being experienced in um, in your municipality um, or in the region of Mpuma, of, of um, Steve Twete and uh, municipalities. Um, without wasting any further time, I will then hand over to Mr. Ngosi um, to give us a perspective view of of of, um, of the of the municipality, Mr. Ngosi. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, colleagues, and my apologies for this technical glitch, but yeah, I'm joining the conversation now. I'm from Situate, and my name is Michael Nkosi. I'm in the Local Economic Development Unit of the municipality and responsible for mainly mining, but the rest of the sectors as well. Thank you. If there's a specific issue or question that I need to tackle, you'll indicate and then I can just zoom into it. Okay, so um, I guess Mr. Ngosi, you were not able to hear some of the inputs that we received from, um, from the panelists that we have. I'll just briefly summarize some of the issues that have been raised. Um, and then just because we just want to hear from the perspective of the municipality as to uh, what are some of the plans or challenge making the plans in terms of responding to the job losses that are uh, that are being experienced as a, as a result of the closure of coal mines as a result of the closure of some of the ESCOM coal-fired power stations and that we are seeing people are seeing that um, those towns are being created. Um, so we just wanted to hear from the perspective of the municipality. How, um, how would the municipality, um, what plans does the municipality have to respond to the current crisis um, and, the, and, the, and the job losses that are being experienced in the region? Okay, I hope I'm following your, your, your line of questioning or the direction of the discussion, but it's all about the impact of the mining sector, the closure of the power stations, and how we are to respond as a municipality or even government as a whole to such. Now, for some time, and if you follow our local economic development strategy, we will have identified the huge economic risk that we have as a mining town. That if you're looking at your Stelfontaine, your Kimberley, and them, they have become ghost towns. Now, we have been saying we need to deal link from over reliance on the mining sector. We need to begin to diversify, and this is what our strategy talks about. We need to diversify and zoom into those other sectors that will sort of balance the, the, the scale in local economic activities. 
hence we say we did some studies in partnership with GIZ in the tourism industry, the mining itself, manufacturing, and the township economy possibility. So the key objective there was that we we need to broaden the local economic activities. One, two, we need to stimulate activities in other sectors other than mining, because we're looking at Johannesburg as a benchmark. Hundred years ago, 1886, Johannesburg was a mining town, but it developed other sectors and industries that yes, at the time were relying on mining, but they did link from mining and now are independent of mining. Today, there's no mining happening in Johannesburg, but it's the hub. It's the investment hub of the continent. So we're following that trend then. What we did, as I'm saying, we did the studies. And out of the studies, we came up with programs and projects. If you look at tourism, we're currently busy with constructing a hotel. It came out as just one project out of the Big study. We're currently doing some pressing plans around your middle of the dam and other areas. We're saying how do we stimulate tourism, for instance, to be one of the leading uh, industries locally. We're doing studies in manufacturing. We're saying how do we revive Heidefeld and link it to activities around your Columbus because this is where you still and manufacturing happen. So these activities, these studies, these programs, these projects are aimed at responding to the huge risk that we're following. And yes, there is an impact on jobs because just the closure of Optima uh, had a huge impact on the local economy, huge impact on our indigenous listeners and municipalities, huge impact from a, a red payer point of view. So what we're saying is mining can't be the only industry that will propel and keep this economy going for some time. Yes, mining will still be here for the next 50, 60 years, but beyond that, what is it that we're doing now that will have an impact beyond mining. So that's where we are. All I'm saying is we are reviewing our plan. We have a 2040 strategy, a long-term plan, where we're saying we're creating industries outside mining. We have the local economy that speaks to your five to 15 years of what needs to happen now from a skills point of view, because we have people that are technically skilled but they are aging. Now, how do we reskill them to fit into the future jobs? How then do we influence the education system to produce not only people that will work in mining, but will work in the repurposed energy producing plants, your ESCO? So, those are the questions, hard questions that we are asking ourselves. And Fortunately, this year is the year of us reviewing the strategy. So come end of the year, we'll have a plan that speaks to all these issues that when mining close or mines close in this area, what happened to us? That's where we are as a municipality. Maybe I'll pause there for now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Ngosi. Um, um, it's encouraging to hear that there's already planning and thinking around uh, diversifying the, the economy of, um, of the region. Um, I want to now just open up to the floor um, so that the uh, comrades can, um, participants can ask questions. I see that we've already got two hands up, and the whole point of this is that we want um, of this of these um, of this event is that we want to hear from the people um, to be able to raise for people to ask questions, raise some issues, and maybe um, I just uh, think they just abuse my my my. Uh, my position as the chair and ask Mr. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Mr. Ngosin, if they are working with or engaging with the various stakeholders, your communities, your trade unions, your businesses, in the in, in this move or this shift in the um, for the you know, the twenty fourteen long term strategy, but um, I will um, King, ask you to respond to that a little later on, Mr. Gosi. Um, I just let's just take a couple of questions, um, comrades. Please do feel free to raise your hands. I see that we already have hands um, up. Um, so I will start with Mr. Amon Tedeme, um, Philip Masangu, um, Mr. Alex Kumalo and Dan Smith, uh, please come in and ask your questions and then we'll give the, the panelists and the respondents an opportunity to uh, come in and respond to them. Uh, so in that order, uh, go ahead uh, Mr. Dedeme. Thank you very much. As uh, I, uh, I've heard actually issues raised, you know, by members of the community by the municipality. I don't know whether I've actually missed, um, you know, the point from the from business as to, uh, in terms of these closures, what is what is their long term objective? Because I have not actually had anyone, even from probably from the department, either the department of, uh, you know, uh, mineral resources and energy maybe sharing their knowledge and expertise in terms of, you know, the issues you remember um, at workplaces, you would actually have um, social and labor plans. I haven't actually heard anyone actually talking about what is actually been uh, uh, planned in terms of the social and labor plans in terms of these uh, mine closures and what is the long-term plans uh, from, from business in regard to um, the impact that the communities are actually going to uh, to suffer. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, the Mr. Tedeme. Um, uh, can we then move on to Mr. Philip uh, Mashangu? Hi, my name is Philip Mashangu uh, from NATO. Malanga Sekunda. My question is uh, almost similar with the first uh, guy, almost. Just, I, I, I was just wanted to hear from the uh, company side, from the employer side, what is their plan according to their, this, uh, this thing of the uh, disaster of uh, losing the job. What, they, what maybe they can do better so that people maybe they can have a job or maybe they can have something to put on the table. Because I've, I've, since I've, we, we started this, uh, uh, a meeting. I, I never hear on the employer side whether maybe they have got a, a plan B for those things. Maybe, maybe for those people that were lost the job, or maybe what they can do for them. Maybe just maybe at least to come up something with their table. I mean to put something on their table. And other thing, uh, I'd like to just to think, uh, emphasize to say now, yeah, we are crying with the colds in South Africa, but. What surprising surprising us? There is a call that is is going outside. To the, I mean, outside the country, just to 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 to, to set it out outside the country. Can't you maybe just to do something when you take out the call, then you put something just it, it, it so that the, uh, the the population of the people mean of the people that they can that lose the job, they cannot be affected much. That's my question. Thank you very much there, Mr. Mashangu. Um, can we then move to Mr. Alex Kumalo? Um, so yeah, uh, please, Mr. Kumalo, just please indicate, say your name and which organization that you're coming from. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Alex Kumalo is the name. I am, uh, maybe I've put my foot in it. I am from the Minerals Council of South Africa. I wasn't expecting the two um, speakers or, 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 or participants to ask the two questions that they asked, but maybe I will start um, with a, um, a contribution and then maybe um, I, I can devil on a couple of the other points that they raised. Um, I, I, I would like to just speak to, to what um, Mr. Ngozi um, was speaking to in terms of um, the importance of diversifying um, you know, all of the economies 
that currently rely on mining. Because we do know, um, and we've seen this many times from Kimberley to Velcom, Caltonville, uh, we've seen that you know um, this resource, when it gets finished, it leaves devastation behind. Um, so there might be development um, and, 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 and some kind of livelihood that, that are sustained during the mining um, um, periods. But when the mines um, 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 stop operating, uh, when they stop mining the resources, then you know we have hardships um, that everyone feels. Um, the other one, you know, because we are speaking about just energy transition, there is one reality um, that we need to plan for um, and start dealing with. Um, the just well, the transition is coming. I do not think that we can run away. I mean, we we heard Tim Sile talking about um, you know the negative side of coal mining. You know, um, health issues. You know, the issues around um, um, pollution of water sources. Um, the 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 um, the fact that some of the land has been sterilized by the fact that it's um, you know that land is polluted, so it can't be used for agriculture. It is for human consumption. So it is important that you know we we take these realities into account. I mean, ESCOM is closing two two power stations, um, 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 Komati and. Um, there's another one that escapes my mind. And the third one is in, not in the same area, but out in um, um, the Palestine municipality. There's a reality. And um, because um, this is part of the energy cluster, ESCOM and the mines, the mines that are tied to those power stations will be affected. And they might need to reduce the output. And if they don't have export markets, um, they might have to close down. And then again, workers will be um, 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 affected. Just on the, um, um, and I'm not really gonna speak for the mining um, companies, because of the nature of, um, of mining itself. But it is important that when we talk about social and labor plans, um, we really um, support the view that says those social and labor plans must not only focus on the today, but they must also focus on the um, post mine closure period. Because that is going to be the most difficult time for, for people who, uh, who live in the shadow um, um, of the head layer next to those mines. And when it comes to export coal, um, again, you know, um, we, on the global front, colleagues, there will be a time when um, the most of the world says we do not want your coal because we also do not want you know, to continue having these environmental challenges mm -hmm. that come with the burning of coal. So it is important that you know, you know, we, we put that into perspective you know, to say, um, while um, there the is coal that's being exported, um, South Africa really needs to start thinking about um, really, really finding an energy mix that will ensure that you know, our children who grow up in Emalaseni, um, in Steve Chuete, um, don't grow up with um, long-term illnesses, that we have access to water, that we can diversify into agriculture, um, that we have the land to do so. But at the same time, we need also to be, you know, to think about the workers that are currently in the space. I think mining currently, coal mining employs close to 90,000 um, um, workers directly. And as we know, um, each one of those workers can support anywhere between five and 10 um, 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 persons. So it is important that, you know, you know, we have this bigger picture and we approach this with the seriousness that it requires, but also in a very balanced manner. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very, very much, um, uh, Mr. Kumalo. Uh, let me bring in then Mr. Dan Smith um, to come in and uh, uh, ask his question. Go ahead, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, I just had a question for um, Anna Martha. I think uh, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce that, but um, she, she spoke a bit about visiting um, uh, mines and mining areas in Germany, and particularly around Dortmund, and she was about to go on and say something about that, but she, she never did. I think she was interrupted and perhaps forgot the thought, and I wondered if she could just um, respond on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Densmith. Um, I'm just going to take um, these next two. I see your hand. Um, um, I will give you a, a chance to come in, um, but uh, I just want to give um, the participants the opportunity to um, to ask questions. Um, Mr. Tedeme, I'm not sure if that is an old hand or if you want to come back with a with another question. Um, but if, if it is a, a an old hand, please do um, take it down. Um, but I will come back to you if it is um, another question. Uh, 
Um, I see Dineo Elizabeth. Um, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry about that. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Ngosi because I live in Steve Chetam municipality. My question is within the long term um, plan for the municipality, is there um, anywhere there is um, uh, uh, strategies or things, how, how would they be able to be providing uh, some training of some sort for green jobs in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dino Elizabeth. Um, let's take the last two hands that I see here, uh, Carla Hudson, and then I will give Mr. Tedeme um, uh, another bite, because I think that is the, the um, follow-up. So let's um, give um, Carla Hudson an opportunity to uh, come in there. Go ahead, Carla Hudson. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, it's actually not a, a, a question. It's um, I don't know if this is maybe the appropriate time, but um, I represent two entities, the Mine Water Coordinating Body and the Impact Catalyst, that is actually looking at a circular green economy for social um, upliftment programs in Mapumalanga province, together with the prov um, provincial and district um, entities as well as national government. So I'm not quite sure if, if I can go ahead or if you would like to bring me in a bit later. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, yes, so basically the Mine Water Coordinating Body started in 2016 as a collaborative body between the mining companies, ESCOM and uh, national government and then uh, with provincial government to actually look at life after coal or life after mining and um, actually looking at the 150 year uh, legacy pollution legacy environmental legacy that's actually left in that area specifically in the upper olifants area which is basically your in kongala steve steve twitty area so um we've had some very high level stakeholder engagements and actually to to look at how we can repurpose and and uh, the word repurposing is is very important here because we're looking at how we can repurpose the mine water the mine land and the mine infrastructure as well as the um, uh, power station infrastructure and water to ensure sustainable circular green economy so we have identified so mwcb um uh, joined forces with the Impact Catalyst um, in the beginning of this year. Uh, the Impact Catalyst actually started in Limpopo in um, partnership with Anglo-American and Exaro to look at health issues in, in Limpopo in the communities um, um, in, in their focus area. So it's actually a really nice uh, collaboration that we have because we looked at sort of the environmental part and the mine closure part and the impact catalyst is really looking at the education and health and sanitation part. So we've realized very quickly that you can't um, do these projects without ensuring that people are, are healthy and that there is a, a decent uh, water and sanitation services in those areas. And then obviously a very important part is, is, is the skills development um, to ensure um, that the skills are available from, from an early age. Um, so we're partnering with people, just as an example, the, the German chamber that does vocational training that would like to bring in their 350 uh, partners to actually do vocational training sites in, in Mapumalanga and that varies from people from Siemens to BMW to Volkswagen. Um, I mean, there's, there's the 350 companies is quite a lot. So we have been actively working in this area to actually look at a holistic solution at this problem. And obviously we in partnership with the Mapumalanga Green Cluster Agency. Um, and we've, we've been in, in negotiations with the DDN processes in, in all these districts. So very quickly, um, is that this process has started. Uh, there is buy-in from public and private entities to do this. I think the next step is we would really like to engage um, 
with with key stakeholders like yourself to actually take this program um, program uh, further so we've actually just been contacted by the department of of education in Mpumalanga um, to look at the Mpumalanga skills development plan and actually take that plan and actually make it an implementation plan and actually see how we because it's very nice on paper but there's no um costing and timelines with that to actually say how are we gonna gonna implement that everybody is talking about a just transition and a fourth industrial revolution but we actually practically need to sit down in collaboration with all stakeholders and actually uh, devise this implementation plan thank you thank you very much i mean this is what we're talking about this is what we knew why we have these um these events so we can link and hear what others are doing and possibly uh, be able to have some so, um, some um, thing, uh, some solutions um, to some of the challenges that um, are being experienced. And I see more and more hands coming up. And there is a lot. I just want to give our um, panelists a opportunity to respond and not um, inundate them with um, with questions. And then we'll see if we have um, time for a. a for a second, uh, for a second round of, of, of questions. Um, but let me just, um, Mr. Philip Mathangu, his hand has been up for quite a while. I just want to take Mr. Philip Mathangu and then you give the op an opportunity to the respondents, to the panelists, sorry, as well as the respondents to um, just uh, uh, respond to some of the questions and issues raised. And um, Ms. Carla Hudson, I don't know if you mind sharing your contact details and um, everybody, it seems like um, you have sparked a lot of interest. So if you could please share a lot, uh, your contact details in the chat, that would be great. Um, so let me give over to Mr. Mathangu um, just to take out uh, to ask his question. Oh, I see Mr. Mathangu is not disappeared. I don't know what happened. Oh, it's a, was it an historical hand? I'm not too sure. But um, then let me just give the, I do see there are three hands up. I just want to give the panelists an opportunity, the panelists and the respondents an opportunity to, um, to, uh, to respond to some of the questions um, and issues that have been raised. Um, so I don't know if there's anybody that would like to go first, or maybe I could just, I know that a lot of the questions were directed to Mr. Corsi. Maybe let me ask you so that you, um, even if you have, I know you also have uh, connectivity challenges. Let me um, give the opportunity to Mr. Corsi just to come in here and respond to some of the issues that have been raised. Go ahead, Mr. Corsi. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to get uh, what, what, what the questions are. I, I know there was a, an issue on the long term plan. And the training mentioned as well. I'm not so sure what's the specific question, but if you're talking long term plans, we are saying as a municipality for government at this level, we need to have a balanced economy so that we don't run a risk of closing down and becoming a ghost town when one sector dies. Remember, we're talking uh, mining that is linked internationally. Directly affect sometimes you can stop piling and still mining later. What happens then? So we, are, we are running away from that as a municipality. We are trying to do those plans, or some of the plans that we have put in place are uh, simply seek to identify opportunities elsewhere outside within the mining sector. Training. Yes, if I've got it right, it's an issue that requires all of us to have a coordinated effort. Because if you look at what is from a schooling point of view, you bring in the various teachers as well, the FET colleges, those that are training us and gearing us for immediate job placement. That effort is not coordinated. And the product out of that is not necessarily ready for the limited available job opportunities. And we have not even spoken about repurposing them or reskilling them.
for future jobs. So training and development needs to be remodeled in a way that it speaks directly to what we anticipate in the future. A few days ago, they released the stats. How many people are unemployed? And of that number, that percentage, how many are the economically active population that are still not employed? And they are aging and they're not getting the right skills at the right time. And they're being outpaced by change. So it's a, it's a whole lot of issues that need to be addressed so that we can get to where we want. Apart from that, a fragmented approach in government only, because we tend to work in silos. But if you look at the relation between government and the private sector, we is not at a level where we knock heads together, we do things jointly, and yeah, we are achieving what we need to achieve in a coordinated fashion. You add fuel to fire, you see a pattern of hostility between mining companies and communities. When we're supposed to be working together in terms of identifying opportunities, contributing to development together, and grow the areas where we're working, we're still not knocking heads together. We're still not coming together in a fashion or in a manner that seeks to address all these issues. Now, there's still a lot of From a government point of view, government to business relationship and community as a key stakeholder. So we need a whole lot of plans put together, but we need to that coordinated in a way that will yield the required resources. And this is where the chambers, your mineral council will play a role. Those environmentalists and green that are available are playing a key role in the space. They need to be visible. We need to have those plans. Differences, yes, we may have. That's not an issue. But the coordination and the bringing together of the resources is key for us to achieve that. You go to government, you may find plans that are known by the private sector, not even by the community. How do you implement those? When are we starting? When are we ending? What are the resources attached to that? We don't know. So we need somebody to have a center that holds. And maybe let me pause there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ngozi. You know, technology, when it works, it is so beautiful. And then when it doesn't, you just want to throw your computer out the window. Um, it's a pity that we, you know, we can't, aren't able to do this uh, face to face uh, because of the pandemic. But um, we kind of lost you here and there, Mr. Gossi. And I hope, um, I think we were able to get the majority of, um, of uh, what you were, you were saying. Um, Comrade Thomas, I see you say so you want to just, um, um, you got some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, um, thanks, Susan. And I would also probably suggest that um, our panelists become very direct and very short in terms of response so that we could allow maybe for further engagement. But in terms of the question and answers, we've got a question from Brendan asking, is it possible to share a list of passive participants in their organizations and contact details. I think um, we'll add it to that. And then Kosazana is asking, is there any plan presented to the workers on closure of coal mines? And uh, the other question from here again is, is this a section 189 process, rehabilitation process? Has it been presented to the correct forums? And then we've got Ntumba asking, the jobs impacts of mine closures is a sole won't. Is it feasible to consider a scheme that includes one, early retirement for those close to retirement, two, a relocation of economically active workers from the shutdown mines or plants to occupy the post left by those put 
on early retirement, and then some form of compensation for the rest if the numbers do not balance neatly. So I think that's some of the questions we would want to respond to uh, from all our panelists. And, and Thank you very much, Comrade Thomas. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Comrade Thomas. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, I see, okay, all right. Um, I don't know, Ms. Anamath, would you like to come in um, and respond to any of the issues or do you have any comments um, with some of the questions that have been raised? Uh, yes, uh, quite a number of issues were raised. So I, if I miss anything, please um, just bear with me. So the main thing um, or the one thing that Dan Smith asked about Dortmund, um, for me, the impact was that there used to be, okay, they want to see my picture, sorry, let me just put it on. Um, for me, the impact was, you could see where all the activities uh, took place at the factories, and now you sit and drink a cup of coffee, um, and there's no real economic activity, um, you know, a couple of tours through the, through the plant, and that is the tourism activity. I think we need to rethink in South Africa um, how we're going to use the facilities that's already there. That is basically um, my, my point of view on this. But I see that um, uh, there was a guy, P, uh, Bobby Peak, that actually did a more in-depth study regarding that. Uh, maybe he can contact, um, uh, they can speak to each other through, uh, through the TIPS channel. Um, that for me is just, I think we need to rethink. We've got the facilities, we spent all the money to, to develop that. Let's see if we can't make it work in a better, cleaner way. The other thing is, what is business doing about uh, business closures? Well, they're following the law. They need to do whatever the Department of Labor says when they need to close down. So uh, for, for us, we can't really do anything different. Uh, if we are in a financial bind, we're in a financial bind. Um, so, yes, um, and the law is being followed, and for us, it's horrible. You know, we'd rather have our businesses working. Um, and just a sec. Um, and then the other thing is um, for um, uh, what is happening within the coal mining sector especially more the independent mines, the banks that don't want to finance them. So they are finding ways to finance themselves. You know, they, there's what guys supply a yellow uh, machinery, that guy high coal, and then between the two of, or three or four companies that actually operate the mines, because there's still a market for coal. Um, and so yes, business needs finance and they make sure it works. You know, I said it's like water. If people want to do business, they will find a way to do business. And then, um, you know, we've run so many training sessions, um, the corporate companies in our area, the chamber, we've had the national tooling initiative here. We, uh, you know, uh, we've got, we had the training for business people on, on tender training and working on heights and everything. So we need more information to what training is needed before saying supplies with training. I think it needs to be um, a, a more in-depth request or you, when you ask that question you must say okay I am looking at uh, embracing the fourth industrial revolution and I don't know how to use um, Google. Is there a training on Google where I can actually train how to use all the digital information that's available? You know so we need better information on what training is needed. And then I just want to um, uh, reiterate uh, with what Michael has said. We have been talking from the chamber side um, also for a couple of years now that we want to re-establish the Middlebrook Forum. So I don't know if Thomas can remember the uh, Middlebrook Forum. It was uh, established in the late 1980s um, where we as a community talked between business and the community members to find a way for us to be successful. Um, and we want that again. Um, we want a way where everybody has uh, uh, opportunities or uh, opportunity to access the opportunities that's there. Now, with all, it, it, it seems like you said it's, it's in silos 
and we need to break the silos. And the way to, to break it is to have a neutral uh, platform where people can talk and um, the chamber is definitely uh, promoting that and um, whoever wants to work with us we will be there and so I hope um, Thomas I'm going to see you you know we've got, got the same views on environmental issues so um, yes I think there's definitely an opportunity where we can now now's the time to find the solutions to make sure our economy works um, I think if that's all the questions if there's any more I well, I'll answer some more. Thank you very, very much, um, Ms. Edamark. Um, um, I think, you know, um, yeah, I just want to also give the panelists um, uh, an opportunity to respond to some of the issues that have been raised. I spoke on with CIPO. You had your hand up. Um, support I mean, please do go ahead. Um, I, yeah. Yes, 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 comrades. Uh, uh yeah mine was mine was not to answer a question it was just a comment uh, but i've been covered by the speaker from the from the government uh, in terms of responding to the issue that the lady was speaking the lady from Malafin, who was saying the coal is also affecting the water so I was just want to respond there, but the, the speaker from the government has just responded. But what I can add is that, you see the whole issue of, of this closing mind because of this air pollution, I don't think it went well because on the other side, there was no training of reskilling of our employees if they, if they are losing job. Now we are starting to, to we are starting to think of the reskilling on everything, whereas there is a, a huge damage. And uh, that is the problem with us, South African. We are so good in, in policies, in, in just talking. We are not, we are so bad in action. So that's where we are here today, engaging, trying to find a solution at the later stage. That was my submission and my comment. I submit Thank you very, very much, uh, Comrade uh, Lamini. Um, I just want to find out, uh, Mr. Kambule, is there anything that you would like to say um, as we head towards closure? Um, any comments or response to any of the issues that have been raised so far? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I concur with the later speaker that yes, SNVM. We, we, we know that we, we, we must engage, we cannot reject. But the issue of skilling and the issue of uh, uh, investing in technology so that we can produce a clean economy uh, must also be addressed. As I've indicated earlier on, that how can the country have a youth uh, that is 73% not having the trick? It's a problem. Who, who, who are we responsible? And I can agree also that, yes, there are many economic or many sectors outside there. Uh, it may be the, 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 because when you look at Mpumalang, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a province that, that grows crops, you know, like your bananas, your mineral, your, 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 your maize, your oranges and so on. That can be the same, but is that sector going to sustain? The standard of living when you close mines. So, so we are we are we are saying the impact of the mine closing is going to be huge on on on, on not only members but on family members as well. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very very much, Comrade um, Kambule. Comrade um, uh, I don't know if you have any um, um, anything. If there's anything that you'd like to raise or respond to as we head towards closure. Yes, this way. Go ahead, go uh, ahead. Concerning the comment, I will put you in the city of Lamin, where we are union. Yebo, Tina, the community, the city of Lamin, where we are union. Yes, yes, yes. We are going to be a show, and we are going to be a challenge, and we are going to be a challenge. Aba sebenzi fanile ba riskilwe. 
yes it's true ene yabonga uguti ugu ya gwazi ena loko so atina we feel uguti kune kune miscommunication or communication breakdown between ama union na basebenz basemayini because ama sebenz basemayini babona kala janga bantabanga na information mailana neche neche et just energy transition so ama unions an information aba ifihlela abasebenz ngoba kube beba banikeza le information leyo ngaba abasebenz abalwe nathi on the ground we don't feel safe anymore thina la ku on la ku ground ngendaba ye j18 abantu bafuna ukuthi sibamuka amathuba omsebenzi so sinalento le ukuthi aba bathi eliciniso hence eventually ilahle lizophela egcineni bangakubalekela lokho manje bangathula bathi siyaya lapho sizofika egcineni ukuthi lahle liphele so kubalulekile ukuthi vele ama mind workers are skilled so that aso khona uchubeka ngempilo kubalulekile ukuthi babatshele ukuthi guys kunente so ezayo so sifuna ukunpreparela yona bangaba fihleli igciniso ngoba bona sikuthi na we feel ukuthi igciniso bayalathi and banalo just net ukuthi ababakhazeli nyabo yeah so Tremsele was basically trying to respond to what Sipo is saying. And um, she says uh, the impression they're getting is that there's a huge gap, a huge knowledge gap between union officials and um, ordinary workers. Because when we engage with workers, then you could see that sometimes even coal workers do not understand the whole issue around the just energy transition. So it, it is important for officials to talk about the just energy transition to their members and um, the workers as well. But um, as, as uh, communities in, 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 in Wheatbank, uh, we, we know that uh, at some point in time, uh, we will reach the end of life of coal and therefore we need to prepare properly. And that includes the engagement and knowledge sharing. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Comrade Thomas. Um, Comrade Taylor, um, let me also give you an opportunity uh, to make some uh, important closing remarks there. Thanks, Izwe. Hey, long time, man. Uh, uh, as I'm standing here, let's come to unions and everyone. I feel ashamed of the unions because now when I, I I can hear that they are talking about saving the mines and unemployment and stuff. As much as the green came, uh, groundwork came in my face, I can see that no, the unions, they're failing the people, they're failing the mines, they're failing everything. And at the end, they will come and say, no, we're still on the process. We're still on the process. As much as now we are, we, are, we are left without work, without everything, because of the unions. I'm sorry on that, it covered Sipo. This thing we are learning, I'd say this is where it's super good about it. And as much as super good, we are cool, we are still here, you know, you know what? After it may, after it cool, you know, so they are there. We are super great, you know, you know what? We are late, we are still here, we are still here. I want to imagine, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, you know what? Man, they say classy nail tea, the something. Hey, for the Safunotum, Chris, don't fire when you put a cool rare, they are saying. But as much as the process is clear and I wish for the best and the please, please, my union, let's comply. We are sure system C, let you know, but Fisher is into a minute of stairs or name I, Bazas. Not to say with this thing by cut to give a man. Talabayas. Talaban everything, but information Talabana, you pass no, but we see that because Christina lent to a beneficiable society. Please, comrades, let us be transparent. Thank you. So, who sees where was saying he, we, I mean, he's honestly begging to say we, we, we need to be open and transparent with each other. And um, he was also supporting what uh, Comrade Timisile was mentioning that. Uh, unionists, especially officials or leaders, uh, sometimes they keep the information themselves, they don't share the information with workers and people. And in the last minute, uh, people will suffer, communities suffer uh, because of that. So if we 
want things to be done, even if we talk about rescaling, uh, some people might be difficult to rescale, for instance, like himself, you will have to take time preparing him for training or putting him in behind the desk. So we need to be very realistic when you think about rescaling as well. But for unionists, uh, he's saying we need to be open and transparent. We need to share the information with our own people so that we, we can avoid some of the conflicts that uh, Tempson is talking about. Thanks, Comrade Thomas. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I just want to say, you know, um, uh, it's, it's such a pity that uh, um, we have this COVID pandemic because it would have been so good to have this session um, um, slightly longer, but also where people can meet face to face and, uh, and be able to engage. And even after at lunchtime or tea time, it would have been really, really great if we um, were able to have the session. And hopefully, as we head towards the end, um, the COVID restrictions um, will have eased down and we'll be able to have these meetings on a face uh, in on a face to face basis. Um, but one thing I just want to say is that you know what, um, we are all going to be affected in this transition. Yo, yes, go ahead, uh, Comrade Sibo. No. Before you close, man, I, I just need 30 seconds. Because okay, go ahead. I don't want to come to Tennessee or no, no, no come to Stan. Behambela, Nepe, the understanding, AB. The understanding that the union has opened. Comrade, the union has not opened. We didn't know anything. We cannot hide anything from our members, from our own brothers. We cannot do that. The person you should, you should blame, you can rather blame your government. You, 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 you have put a white monopoly monopo capital is there. You can blame that one, not the union. We have been fighting for you for such a long time. We can, I don't want you to go with the perception that we, we are not open. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank you for that, Comrade Stello. And I think, you know, um, it's important for us to remember that, you know, um, as much as workers belong to trade unions, but workers, before you become a worker, you are part of a community, you come from a community. When you leave that workplace, you are then go back to a community. And we are all going to be affected in this transition. Um, whether it's business, whether it's the municipalities, whether it's the uh, the communities, whether it's the workers, we are all going to be affected in this transition to a, a low carbon economy. Um, comrades, I just want to, um, it's a pity time is not with us. I just want to hand over to Comrade Gaylor to close us off. Um, and I hope we'll be able to meet again in person sometime very, very soon. Um, uh, these restrictions. Uh, I just want to thank you all very, very much. Uh, I hear Comrade Thomas, and I'll hand over. I just before Gaylor sees yeah, I think it was interesting to hear um, the municipality talk about all the different plans in terms of skilling, tourism, manufacturing. I think um, I would want to ask um, Comrade Mike to share some of those plans uh, with us because uh, I believe it might inform part of the work that we're doing in the area and also inform how we engage with the different stakeholders. Uh, at least it gives us an overview of wh where do we start in terms of our work. So I think it would be nice if you share some of those plans with us. Thanks, Comrade Thomas. And Galo, over to you. Thank you so much, Sizwe uh, and Thomas. And there you have it. Uh, we've run out of time. We could have we could have carried on for for a couple of hours more. I'm sure the discussion was on fire. Um, but you know it was extremely rich, and I think you you, you all agree that you know, we really talked about real issues. You know, it was about livelihood, about jobs, about health, about skills, about plans for the future for Emma Shaney, for Steve Trete, for Mpumalanga, for people. Um, and, you know, we talked about service delivery. We talked about so many real on the ground uh, grassroots issues, which we all need to, uh, to consider as we, as we move ahead and try and craft and foster this transition together. 
And I think that's what's really important is that you know, we have different voices coming from different places um, and you know, we all are together in this. You know, we could have carried on the discussion uh, forever and we will continue the discussion beyond this event. Uh, that remains for me to uh, thank everyone. Thank you to our uh, facilitators. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our respondents. Thank you to all who attended. Uh, the uh, recording will be uh, available as well. Uh, and we'll make sure to uh, remain in touch with you and look forward to keep working with you and engaging with you on fostering a just transition uh, going forward Hello. in South Africa and beyond. Right, and feel free to reach out. Uh, of course, you can put your, your details uh, in the chat. Uh, or you can reach out through uh, through tips, through the lady, through our work, uh, and then we can uh, carry on the discussion. I thank you very much. Uh, have a good day further. Uh, until next time. <laughs>